Have you got it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am here with a coaster. Coaster is called. Yeah. Abhi, abhi nahi karna post. After. Okay. After a talk or maybe after the. Yeah, after a talk. Good afternoon to all of you. Today we are going to discuss the book, Asarari, A Life Full of Life. Asarari, a disembodied voice with unlimited access to an ancient pool of wisdom, is authored by Rajni Sikri Sibbal. This session is going to be chaired by Dr. Yogindra Narayan, a 1965 batch retired Indian Administrative Service Officer of Uttar Pradesh Kader, a former Secretary General of Rajya Sabha. He also served as the Defense Secretary of the India, Chief Secretary of Uttar Pradesh, Surface Transport Secretary of India. He is the current Chancellor of Hemmati Nandan Bahugana Garwal University, situated in Pori Garwal district of Uttarakhand. Dr. Narayan has several books, including a book on poem and civil services. Now I request Dr. Yogindar Narayan to take the discussion forward. Over to you, Dr. Narayan. Uh, thank you, Ushaji. And good afternoon to all my co-panelists on this program. Uh, I'm so proud as an ex-IAS officer to see a book written by Rajni, who is also formerly of the IAS service. And then we have Jay Kumarji also from the IAS. And then we have two brilliant academicians, lady acad academicians who are with us. And I'm sure the discussion would be very interesting and uh, uh, very uh, innovative. I've gone through the book, Rajni, and I must congratulate you for writing an unusual but fascinating book, which you have titled as Asa Riri. The book uses the idiom of dialogues to pass on ancient wisdom through a disembodied voice. Nisha is the central character with whom Asa Riri interacts to answer all her queries on life and to clear her doubts on the nature of existence, happiness and death. The author has used the dialectic method by adopting discussion and reasoning as the preferred mode of intellectual investigation. While Asariri uses the Socratic technique of exposing false beliefs and eliciting truth to answer the queries and doubts of Nisha, the latter uses the Platonic method of investigation of the eternal quest to understand the eternal ideas. The central figure of this whole book is Nisha, who has lost both her husband and her father. Her father had no faith in any religion, and neither does Nisha. However, her father had a philosophy of his own, which Nisha has also imbibed. Her father had told her that life is great, 
it offers you the opportunity of attaining your own potential many times and it is unfortunate if you don't grow and she has taken that to heart to help her grow and understand is the disembodied voice of ashariri who is ashariri nisha's aunt describes him as thus and ashariri is a friendly disembodied voice it is your link of to your ancestors a strong genetic tie across the ether a cauldron of the combined wisdom of your ancestors a pool of ancient knowledge beliefs and way of life that is ashariri when nisha tells her aunt that she does not believe in anything that she can't see with her own eyes anything that is not tangible her aunt says very wisely that the cosmos has numerous forces that you know nothing about the entire book into elia is the journey in fact of nisha and lighting and lightened from time to time by the by the wisdom of asariri through asariri the author expounds her philosophy of life asariri has profound knowledge of the life on earth as well as beyond it it teaches nisha the art of good parenting on achieving happiness controlling anger on life choices and life goals dreams and successes the most intellectually stimulating chapter is chapter 15 of this book which talks about serenity karm and kismat to the question what serenity ashri says serenity is active cooperation with the inevitable and here the author through asariri explains that one should simply do his bit to the best of his ability and leave the rest to nature to take its own course serene in the knowledge that nature follows karmic laws which are intrinsically rational before i close i would like to quote an intellectually stimulating conclusion which nisha arrived at after her conversation with asariri she says i sense there is that there is something out there that i know nothing of an intangible power that i can feel sometimes when i am on a hill top waiting for the sun to rise or at dusk by the sea when the whole world is a riot of colors i sense that i am not alone there is someone or something behind the clouds somewhere what an interesting description of the environment the author in every chapter of her book leads off by some quote from the upanishad or by buddha or her own quote and expounds the philosophy which she is would be uh, imbibed in and which she wants to uh, understand better through asha reading these are my opening remarks which and i'll be commenting later on but i would uh, before i close i would like to ask the author as to what is this uh, uh meaning of i who is i and what do you understand uh, of this uh, word because you end up by saying that i want to understand who am i i think that's an internal question which we all have in our lives and i think you'll be the best person to answer it in the way you think so so over to rajni to you uh kindly expect on your book and kindly let, let us know what motivated you to write this book what inspired you to write this book and why did you choose the character of a disembodied soul to explain this philosophy to everybody so over to you rajni please go ahead thank you 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. I, um, chairperson, panelists, members of the ISC, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me immense pleasure that so many of you are out there. I can't see you, but virtually you're there. And this is the best that we can do in an environment where a book is brought down, uh, brought out during the lockdown. Um, after the pandemic broke out, this is my second book. The last one uh, was The Haunting Himalayas. It came out in winter last. And that's the first launch I had on a webinar where you can't really see who you're talking to, but I'm sure you're there. Um, I want to thank, before I, in fact, respond to your question, Mr. Narayan, I want to first, um, you know, thank my publishers, Bloomsbury and uh, Haranand of The Haunting Himalayas and Penguin, which is bringing out a new book in November for having such faith in me because um, in these troubled times where everything is on Amazon and uh, not even libraries and bookshops are open, I think that's tremendous faith. Thank you. Well, um, Asari, um, this is the book. Um, it's, it's a product of 12 long years, maybe more actually, maybe what, 16 to 17 years. And um, it's as much mine as it is my father, Mr. Kaval Krishan Sekhri's. Mr. My father um, died rather young. He was a juvenile diabetic. And um, it's developed out of numerous conversations with him over endless cups of morning tea. Um, and then contemplations, my own meditations in the morning. I'm a morning person, as you can see, you know. I learned to have the courage to think for myself, for my father. I learned to act as for my own convictions. And the rational and prudent beliefs that one acquired were imbibed from him. And I think what, another thing that I owe to him is his, the fact that he introduced me to some um, a uh, very sagacious literature when I was rather young, including Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and the Upanishads. Now, the Upanishads are tough. They're, they're difficult Sanskrit, but uh, he would demystify them for me. And I, over the years, what I have done right from when he was still alive was, you know, put down on pieces of paper, scraps of paper. And now, of course, on the on the laptop, uh, thoughts that kind of arise from my discussions with him, from the books I read. And um, I think for the last, uh, during the lockdown, I discovered these scraps of papers with me. And I, Asa really is actually born out of that. Asa really is born out of that. It relates the journey of the protagonist from bewilderment, a sense of NY, to acceptance and serenity. The protagonist is a young uh, girl as uh, a doctor, as the chairperson just told you, who has two children and has lost both her husband and her father in quick succession. So she, uh, at the beginning of the book, um, there are lots of problems and uh, she feels totally bewildered. And um, it is Asariri who sees her through this long journey. Um, and makes her understand that there is more to the world than actually meets the eye and enables her to live a life that's a more fuller life. The protagonist meets the white, wise Asariri in diverse situations, you know, on top of a hill that's covered with uh, daisies and irises in spring, um, at the edge of a um, tsunami ravaged Bay of Bengal, a town in, um, in that area, in the valley of the gods at the end of a trek, and of course, uh, beneath the quince tree outside her house on a full moon night with the Snow Peak Mountains uh, as witnesses to their conversation. Uh, who is Asa really? Uh, wow, in the words of the Katha Upanishad, we all have an Asa really, uh, within ourselves, always. This is uh, the second Vali that says that there is an Asariri really between in all of us. Um, Asariri really is a disembodied voice that has unlimited access to a, an ancient pool of wisdom. Uh, let me quote from Bua in the book. Um, Mr. Narayan quoted some of it and said what Bua said Asariri really was about. But uh, I'd like to just expand on that. I'd like to elaborate the fact that the cosmos has numerous forces that you know nothing about, my dear girl, is what Bua told Nisha. And then goes on to say, well, if a person dies young, and I quote, well, if, when a person dies young or suddenly the soul is troubled by all that is left unsaid and undone, 
The soul in the form of a disembodied voice, the asariri, communicates with those who are left behind. The asariri conveys what the deceased could not express due to a sudden demise. If you care to listen, the asariri also pa uh, pa pauses and, um, and passes on the wisdom from the past. Most people think they had a dream and don't give it much, much credence. Others cannot even recall the dream. An asariri is a strong genetic tie across the ether, a cauldron of the combined wisdom of your ancestors, a pool of ancient knowledge, beliefs, and ways of life. Well, uh, the book portrays the protagonist's life in a quaint Himalayan town, uh, a trek to the Valley of Gods, and the tragic loss of 10,000 odd lives to the 2001 tsunami, a very tragic. 2004 tsunami, please, uh, sorry. Her life experiences um, are interspersed with the conversations um, and the dialogue that she has with Asariri, which encompasses a range of different issues which concern all of us today. Uh, they were mentioned, I think, life choices, the art of parenting, happiness, how to deal with anger, uh, balance of life, balance in nature, dreams and success, and um, some esoteric questions that we ask ourselves, you know, what is life? What is death? What is there beyond the horizon, unseen, unknown, across known frontiers, but there? Uh, so to answer your question, uh, who am I? Uh, let me turn to the book. Let me say what Asariri said to that. And uh, you know, who is the real I? Well, let me uh, state that Asariri asks the same question of Nisha, the protagonist. And he says, if I may quote uh, page 90. Um, OK. So um, he asks her, tell me who you are without using your name your address, the country you belong to, your academic degrees, your occupation, your designation, your status at work, your features, the color of your skin, your hair, your faith, your belief system, your attitudes, your beliefs, your interests, and your... And then Nisha tells him, that's tough. How do I do that? And why should I? I mean, is my name not my own? Aren't the rest of the characteristics myself? Are they, are they not intrinsic parameters that define me? And then Asariri says, no. No, dear, these attributes describe a part of you for, for the time being, but they're not the core. For they are temporary and mutable and can change within your life at any time. So he goes on to say, your address can change tomorrow. I mean, that's natural, right? You will retire from your job one day. I have already. You can take up a new occupation. You can go back to school and pick up a new degree. You may even decide to change your name, color your hair pink if you want, get a fancy new nose, or change your gender. I mean, they're all possibilities. And then if that is what really defines you, if one, any of these attributes, any of these, um, these characteristics define you, then I mean, it's constantly changing. It's uh, it's like the shifty pseudo pseudopedia of a restless amoeba. Then exactly who are you? Nothing, just a puff of air, poof. So then he uh, really spells out exactly what I am, you know, what, 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 what's, who's the real I? And I quote again, you are, dear friend, more than your tangible attributes, more than your name, your occupation, your address and nationality, for that are eternal, for these are external to the core you and amenable to change. You are definitely more than your own body, more than your brain, your limbs, the color of your skin, for your body will age, wither away and finally die. Your own loved ones will burn your body to ashes or put it under six feet of dirt. Yet you won't feel a thing. You won't feel any pain. For you are more than that. 
more than all of these and more than the parts put together. The core you is a subtle, intangible essence. All that exists has a subtle essence. The core, the self or the soul, call it what you may. You are the self, the self is you, for the self in you is the same as the self you see in people you love. As in those you may not like, as in all those you know nothing of, as in those who are alive, as in those who are no more, and also as in those who are still to be born. The true self remains the same, the rest are all externalities. There is a thread of oneness that runs across all human beings, irrespective uh, thank you, of Rajni. gender, Can we... color, and caste. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Rajni. Uh, Supratha ji, we would like to hear your comments on this book. Uh, all of you would be knowing her. She is a noted Indian poet, critic, and an academician of many years of standing. And she has been the recipient of many prestigious grants, as well as national and international fellowships. And she has over four decades of teaching experience. So over to you, Supratha ji, for your comments on the book. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think um, uh, I feel extremely uh, privileged to be here because I think these are the questions that particularly not just in post retirement period, but I think all through life, particularly if one is writing poetry or doing art in any form, I think we are all obsessed with this question as to who am I? And I'm glad that this was taken up, but I do want to say that as I read the book, as a student of literature, I asked myself, is this fiction? Is this a diary? Is it a journal? And I don't think it fits, it fits in into any one of those categories because the form itself, the way uh, it has been projected or articulated, the ideas, the way that uh, they have been articulated, are definitely in the form of sharing. It's communication. It is sharing with another. And it's not a diary because then it would be jottings, which would be meant only for the person who is writing. But it's more than that. It's not fiction because it doesn't look concocted at all. It doesn't have a plot of any kind, but it has a flow. And that's what I appreciate in this particular book, because there is a kind of a flow from a certain sense of uh, say, call it a vacuum, a kind of a nothingness, which slowly begins to fill up. Just as existentially, the protagonist, um, well, there is a name there to the protagonist, Nisha, and you do feel that there is a subjectivity out there. There is a subjectivity maybe of the writer. We don't mind that, whether there's a writer or somebody else, but there is a subjectivity. But the fact that it moves out of the subjectivity to eternal wisdom, to wisdom of all time, I think it's important to note that because it doesn't retain itself or doesn't remain into the domain of just subjectivity, a very personalized kind of form of thinking. On the one hand, it can be seen as a kind of loud thinking, but on the other hand, it is something which comes out of uh, voices which are within a person. So if there is an asariri, it is within oneself, within each one of us, uh, you know, we do have one. And it is those, I, I love that statement which comes up, that there is a certain kind of language of silence. Are we trained to listen to that language of silence? Do we understand it? As you see, art is, doesn't lie only in writing poetry or write, or making a painting or something. Art comes into its being through the idea of art of living itself. And I think this book is dealing with art of living through the wisdom that has got accumulated over centuries. And how does one subjective self dip into that? By dipping into that, I mean that one has to remain open, number one, as a quest. You take it on as a quest in order to look for meaning, in order to desire um, the idea of filling up, particularly because there is a sense of loss here. 
there is a sense of loss because the protagonist has lost two dear people. And so uh, out of that nothingness, sense of nothingness, there is a kind of a transformation that is taking place within the subjectivity of the narrator who is transforming herself into certain kind of suggestions of how to live and the possibilities of existence. Because one of the pertinent questions that come up, I think, is what is happiness? And I think it's very important to define this happiness in order to achieve a certain kind of sense of fulfillment. And I think the essence here of that particularly disembodied uh, uh, you know, kind of self that we are referring to. Now, this self, there is also a suggestion here. And to my mind, of course, if I were to use a word, I would use sense of being there. But doesn't matter. This is only a change of vocabulary. But the point is that the the self that we are really looking for is beyond, beyond the whole idea of even death. It is beyond death. And therefore, there is a suggestion of continuum. There is a life that is kind of life beyond life kind of thing, which is that all the lives that one may have, there is a continuum. And to be able to capture that continuum, I think one needs to probe and explore and have an inner journey. And I think this journey is an inner journey. And the intrigue that comes up, the intrigue that the book is presenting, a kind of a mystique of a certain kind, actually unravels itself petal by petal. It's almost like you know, a, a fragrant rose which is in front of you. And petal by petal, you are looking at it. You might call it wisdom. But this is not just wisdom, which is lived wisdom. It is wisdom that has also been lived by the ancestors. So it's a continuum. And you do think of it as though you are dipping into it today, not to restrict it to yourself, but also preserve it for the future. So it is a certain kind of a seeker's, uh, 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 seeker's sharing, in a way. And the dialogue is actually a dialogue, which is, again, uh, uh, something that I'm taking from the book, which says, what is unsaid and what is undone by the previous, maybe the father or whoever, doesn't matter who, but the previous generation maybe, it is that undone and unsaid that gets to be done and also to be articulated. And in this flow of the river of articulation, in a way, the communication that is happening, it is also suggestive of, to me, it is also suggestive of evolution of a spirit evolution of um, life itself, and also to look at the endless possibilities that life can present itself. There is no end to it. There is no end to the kind of wisdom that can be accumulated. Now, this wisdom is not an, you know, if we say it comes from the ancestors, it doesn't mean it's archaic. It has an eternal value. And I think it is that that one appreciates out here, it doesn't come in the form of preaching. It, if it were to be preaching, I would just close the book and keep it aside. But the words are throbbing. It's not preaching. If it, if, it, if it were to be that, then there would be a problem. But this is sharing. And I'm glad that the author decided to share this. And obviously, it's um, not just an experiment. It's a deep journey from within. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very well spoken. Uh, may I now request Shri uh, Jay Kumarji uh, to give his comments. Uh, Shri Jay Kumar is a poet. He's a translator. He's a lyricist and an artist. And he writes both in Malayalam and English. And he has published 32 books, including eight anthologies of poems. He is uh, at present the founder, vice chancellor of the Malayalam University and serves as the, as the director of the Institute of Management and Government and lives in Kerala. Yes, over to you, Dr. Jayakumar. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Narayan, sir. And uh, I recognize uh, the author here. <coughs> author is not uh, unknown to me because I had the opportunity of participating in the book review, her poetry book review, a few months ago, which had the flavor and the fragrance of the Himalayan 
Himalayan breeze, which I can detect in this book also. This book, of course, is not uh, poetry, but um, but the poet in her alone is capable of writing this book. As uh, Subhuta Paul said, had it been just um, uh, you know raw wisdom that was being <laughs> dispensed in this book, this book would have lost its value and uh, appeal. Rather, this book comes from her very being, and I should compliment her for the form of this book. This fo the form uh, content, of course, is there, but the form to to discover the appropriate form is perhaps one of the most uh, difficult tasks of creativity. You might have a lot of things to say, but unless you discover the right kind of form, which blends with your content with, with what you have to say, the book can never be. Uh, book can never be uh, com completed rather, rather. So this form fits in into what she has to say. And she discovered the right kind of, uh, not only the protagonist, but the Ashariri, uh, which of course is a very fascinating concept. And the dialogue itself, of course, she lapses into poetry off and on, or whenever possible, I should say, or because she is essentially a poet, I should, uh, I can make out. And whenever the conversation takes her to a particular wavelength, the author lapses into poetry, which is good, which actually gives the, po the book, uh, book its own uh, value. Uh, in a veiled manner, she would uh, concede that there is a lot of autobiographical content in that. And what is the key to uh, discover that there is autobiography in this, although it may not be very relevant for literary critics, but I'm only amused or rather uh, happy to discover this connection between this linguistic connection between the protagonist and the, and the author. Author is Rajani, uh, Sanskrit means night, and Nisha is also night. So I think it's a very clever uh, way of telling that, yes, there are autobiographical overtones to this narrative, which of course may or may not add value to the book, but I think for, uh, for some authors, it has a value because the soul of the author, the heart of the author is very much there. These are not intellectual uh, inheritance from organizations which she has tried to sort of uh, rehash and tell us. Uh, that is the fear that um, uh, Sutada Kumar has uh, mentioned. Had it been a rehashing of the Upanishads, paraphrasing the Upanishads, Mandra, Upanishads, it would have been a different uh, ball game altogether. But this is quite personal. Personal in the sense she talks continuously. This, this, she has this dialogue with Ashiriri. Ashiriri is invisible though but not inaudible. He comes off and on in very crucial moments and shares infinite wisdom with her in a language which she understands and also keeps her guessing, keeps her intellectually excited, emotionally excited. Or rather, uh, the Ashariri's uh, contribution is to rekindle a great fascination for life as such. Life means life as well as death. Everything becomes a matter of fascination for the protagonist, which is what Ashariri does. Who is Ashiriri? Uh, uh, so many people have tried to answer this question. I'm not going to go, for, go in for that. But then uh, poets of all times had this great fascination to talk to this invisible being. You know, Tagore called it Jeevan Devada. Jeevan Devada, he said. Of course, it is not exactly this. But then some kind of a personal god or a personal uh, voice uh, he can address. Jeevan Devada, he called. And uh, I think we... When we were in schools, in convent schools and all that, um, you know, we used to be told that, that there is always um, an angel, a guardian angel, who listens to everything and helps you out. So this, it, it's an archetype, you know, to have some, that invisible uh, being with whom we can communicate. I think that is what, that is how the concept of Ashariri evolves. And of course, with the passing away of your very close father, very dear father, the urge to communicate is reciprocated. That is it. The universe, as they say, the invisible dimensions of this existence reciprocates your longing to communicate and that communication comes back to you in the form of a shiriri. A shiriri may be very powerful, but then he cannot be such a shiriri. He cannot take a form. He can only be a voice. Such is the law of nature, the law of the universe. Actually, this book, uh, I meant to get this hard copy of the book incidentally. So I am not able to quote because reading the PDF, then taking down, that was too much of a hassle. So I just, I'm, I'm recalling what I read. You see, the 
And uh, basically, the, what is this book finally trying to convey? I thought that I'm, re, uh, I'm reminded of the famous lines of William Blake, like you try to see the world in a grain of sand and infinity in an hour and that, that stuff, you know. There is significance to even the most insignificant thing in life. Every insignificant life thing in life is significant. Only thing is, we do not know the significance. We can only see, we don't have the vision. We only hear the musical notes, but we don't listen to the whole orchestra or the symphony. We know these uh, small patches of color, but we do not see the whole mural. I think it is that kind of, a, the whole pattern is missing. We have only small pieces. That is how most of us live our lives, seeing the fragments of life without understanding its context, its connectivity, its perspective, and its fittingness, if I may use a wrong, uh, a very clumsy word. <laughs> its fittingness in the whole uh, fabric, you know. Nothing, nothing is a misfit in this world. Nothing is a misfit. Everything fits into a grand symmetry. It's a huge symmetry. I think Ashuriri is trying to nudge the protagonist into this realization that life is not a simple thing which starts with somebody's life, ends with somebody's death, as uh, Sukuta said. Life is that which goes on beyond your death. Life is a continuum. My life is a continuum with your life, everybody's life. Life is a huge, infinite flow. We are grateful for being part of that great flow. The moment you understand that it is, we are part of this great flow, great current, life, under, life gets meaning. Life acquires a new meaning, a new significance, a new beauty, a new connectivity. I think all spirituality that Upanishads talk about and even the great sages talk about is nothing but this awesome realization of this connectivity. I think Ashariri is slowly, slowly nudging her slowly taking her into this great realization of this oceanic beauty that is all, all around, all around. That gives a new eyesight, a new vision about life, about unhappiness, about miseries, about tragedies, about accidents, about tsunami, everything. Everything falls into the place, into place. You cannot prevent disasters in this life, but you can always your perceptions can be corrected. And that is what this book does. Actually, Rajani is giving us distilled wisdom without saying that this is distilled wisdom. That is the uh, slate of hand, if I may say so. Uh, she doesn't say that I am giving you great wisdom, distilled wisdom of the Upanishads. Also, she prefixes every chapter with the Upanishads quotes or with the Buddhist quotes. That only gives a sort of um, perspective. I think ultimately, this book conveys to us what is contentment, who are you? Ashariri gives this kind of eternal wisdom to her and to us. We are grateful to her for having framed a book, uh, formulated a book in such a format where you don't feel inferior. Oh, I never knew these things. You see, these great, uh, great books of wisdom make you feel slightly slow. I am a fool. I never knew these things. Here, the protagonist grows with us. We are with her, and she is with a larger uh, wisdom. You know. So that kind of transmission takes place. So we are happy to follow her in chapter after chapter, sometimes discovering, yes, I have also had these flashes of insight. So this gives a, a more purpose to life, a more purpose to life. Like when you walk and you see a small thistle or a small blade of grass and you are fascinated by it for a flash of a second, I think we see into the life of things as words would say. We see into the life of things. I think it is that kind of vision uh, that this gives and I enjoyed reading it but I look forward to getting the book please send it or I can get it from my bookstore here I was waiting for that to arrive but um, anyway I really enjoyed the book it's a matter of great uh, honor and uh, gratification that you could write a book like this but then I should have guessed from your earlier poems which is filled with the whiff and fragrance of the Himalayan valleys and dales I should have guessed that it is not impossible it's not beyond you to come out with a book um, coming out of your experience. Your loss of your father is a great thing. But then loss of your father is a personal loss, but you convert it into a universal kind of significance. Losing a father is a natural thing. Every father, everybody's father will go away, but nothing goes away. We are in a closed circuit. Certain circuits we can't find, but then circuit is there. I think that is 
that is vasudeva kudumbakam if i may say maybe a wrong interpretation but thank you this yeah, family of life of uh, of uh, chetana and achetans uh, everything is connected i think that gives this book gave me that flash that is more than sufficient to make it make an author worthwhile and feel happy about it congratulations congratulations rajni i mean I what he is saying thank you thank you sir thank you jay kumar ji lovely commentary on this book even though you have not read it physically no no i have read it i have read but you have understood I have read the pdf much. copy but nothing like holding the book in your hand you know? yes you are right uh, can i now request uh, dr asha sarangi to please give her comments on this book uh, dr asha sarangi is a professor at the center for political studies jawaharlal nehru university and she received her phd from the department of political science of the university of chicago usa uh, over to you dr asha sarangi ji please give your comments and uh, let me just start by thanking um, uh, the author for inviting me and giving me this privilege to share my views on the book uh, i would also like to congratulate her for writing such a beautiful book i think the other panelists have already mentioned it and i must also say in the beginning that i thoroughly enjoyed reading this book and i was lucky to have a hard copy of it hold it in my hands and feel the essence of the book uh, i think um, much has been said by the rest of the panelists so i won't like to repeat uh, because the book has touched the core within all of us in a strikingly similar way but since each one of us has a very distinctive world view a distinctive set of experiences in our own life we can also relate and and share in a in a very cohesive manner but also in a very distinctive way so i would like to begin by saying that the book is a deeply reflective one with a unique narrative style which i would like to characterize it as a poetic prose because it has both prose and poetry and when you start reading it the poetry actually overwhelms you the poetic form demands more and more poetry to come from within the prose so that's the beauty that's the format that's the narratological style that i really enjoyed reading uh, about the uh, uh, asariri i think uh, now it is well known who the asariri is and why the author has given the name of asariri uh, i was just talking to the author this morning and the term is not only unique to north indian Uh, vocabulary but i think it also is used in malayalam i was told and maybe in other languages as well so as in this embodied self central around the events of the author both personal and professional of her life uh, the narrator na- named nisha and her father as she said passed away 18 years ago um, so there are number of conversations that nisha brings out uh, reiterates them in this book with her father and the dialogical form of the conversation between the two revolves around everyday events of life and i think that's the beauty of it that how she actually brings out the everydayness of those events those um, you know um, stages various periods of her life um, sara and neel the two children predominate the narratives of the, the of the book in a remarkable way um as as the author herself describes that asariri is symbolic of a life full of life and i think that's the phrase that really has stayed uh, in me a life full of life even after death there is a life full of life and that's what she actually wants to celebrate and wants to remember of her father that in this disembodied voice is also one of caution one of care one of advice one of suggestion one of reflection to the next generation to her child um, and the child misha is here because of asariri so there is this very interesting you can call it umbilical cord relationship but i think it is more than that as i think um, jack kumar sir was saying that it is sort of universal and it 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 is sort of ubiquitous and so and so forth so so this 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 asariri and the relationship with asariri of a ch- his child is something that is you know is not something unique but also something 
um, common to all of us in our life, whether it is father or mother. But I think the role of the parents in the life of the child is something that everyone can have books written on. So it is the journey of life which has also lived through pain, suffering, joy, uh, and many other mysteries of life, I would say, that uh, Nisha brings out in her style of writing. The question still remains, how do we unlock it? Uh, through wisdom gates of our scriptures, through our ancestral wisdom, through Upanishads, through Vedas, through any other kind of you know uh, scriptures, or do we actually evolve with our own common sensical understanding of these uh, wisdom gates that we actually tread upon throughout our life? So, I mean, who comes first is the question, um, the, 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 the eternal question, whether I'm born with the knowledge or whether I acquire knowledge on my way of becoming what I become. So the serenity of places, I think, of Masuri, Dalhousie, um, and, and other places runs through the text in such a beautiful way that it, the closeness of the nature, um, living in nature, with nature, which wafts and weaves the narrative of the book uh, is something which I think really touches the heart of uh, uh, the reader, I would say. I was really, really touched by it. And I think that's the beauty of the book, that it's it, it comes out so naturally, the kind of symbols she uses, the kind of comparison she makes with the nature, the beauty of the nature, the, the aura of the place and, and the wind and the air and the trees, it all combines together. Another facet of the book that I would like to just share is the fact that there is a role reversal here. Uh, the father and the child, the, the father and the daughter, and now the daughter herself has become a parent and how the, the father begins to advise or the daughter wants to take certain advice. So what happens when this kind of role reversal happens in actual life uh, is something that we all have gone through. You know, when your children grow up and when you start learning from them or when they become your parents, like uh, they, 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 they start behaving like your parents. So I think that's that side of the narrative that really is something remarkable, which comes out very naturally in the book. Um, then I think uh, uh, the book also talks about karma and kismat and something that I really liked, um, which, which, which talks about number of emotions, sensibilities, pangs, yearning and longing for the life, for the ones one lost on the way, um, whether it is a karmic uh, thing or it is something to do with your destiny is an unresolved issue, which all of us have been, you know, always thinking, brooding about uh, without knowing the actual answers to it. So um, in some way, um, the, that balance in life and death, I think that the book is talking about or actually referring to is also a lesson to take from this book. How do we strike a balance between life and death? Knowing the fact that death is not too far away for all of us, we are going to have it, we are going to embrace it and go on. Um, but our loved ones left behind or the, the one who lose their loved ones. So it is this uh, sense of loss, but also the sense of celebration of the one you lost, whose life you want to emulate, whose lessons you want to continue to take throughout your life. So I think that's, that's the crux of the life um, and death relationship that the author is talking about. So Asariri is a reality of human life. It's not something um, only, uh, you know, a, a figment of imagination. Uh, it is very much a reality of human life. Suffering and pain, joy and jubilation um, is not only till one is alive, but also one how one leaves behind for the others. Um, so the sense of Atman and Gita, you know, the soul, um, which does not get burnt or destroyed or perished, comes alive through this book, you know, once again. So it is eternal, but it is also ethereal. I thought it is ethereally eternal is something that uh, the author is trying to communicate. It is beyond any human form and bondage. We all know it. Um, so, but each one of us relates to it in a different way. 
uh, with the figure of Ashariri in our own life. Um, and I think that's where the life's meaning actually has to be uh, situated, turned, made sense of, um, and so on and so forth. So Ashariri is both a self and as well as a, a very much a living self, as well as a disembodied self, disembodied voice. And I was just thinking that in the times we are living, um, this Asariri figure is no longer Asariri. It actually has acquired a certain kind of embodied self because it is a cosmic truth that every death is a new beginning. And the COVID has really taught us how do we make sense of it. And I would just like to read from page 8 a verse that the author actually says, which I think in some way summarizes the book. Let me just quote. There are things profound, difficult to realize, and hard to understand, both sweet and subtle, melodious and tranquilizing, not grasped by mere, logic, by mere logic, visible to a discerning mind, comprehensible only to the wise. So the book is not just a tribute, I would say, to a beloved fa father by a loving daughter, but it is a father who was a friend, who was a philosopher, who was a guide to his child, and there was a karmic bond. There is a karmic bond between them, which has a state, despite the fact that he's no more physically with her. In another sense, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, creative, poetic prose that actually brings all of these emotions alive in the book. And I know I don't have time, so let me just end, even though I wanted to add a few more things. I would just raise two quick uh, points and maybe author can tell me as to what her thoughts are on it. Um, one is, what is left after the loved ones are gone? What is it that we are left with? Apart from the fact that we, 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 we have memories, reminiscences, moments to celebrate or mourn that loss. Is there something else also that we are left with? That's one. And second, um, how did the serenity of life or serenity of the context that you have in the book, um, that you have lived so close to the nature, affected your recapturing of the memories? Would it have been different had you been in a different kind of a place where you had have lived and shared your life with your father? And I think the third question that I have is the times that we are living in, the times of COVID, where we have seen that our moving away from nature has also actually taken us to the sea of miseries where we have lost, you know, thousands of our dear ones. Um, do, what would Asariri have to say to that if he were alive today? How would he have described COVID-19 and loss of our loved ones? Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, Asariri. I think all the uh, panelists have somehow find, find themselves linked with a lot of thoughts and feelings that have been a part of this book. And I think that's the success of this book, Rajni, that you have got all those who read this book get involved because they feel there's something close in that book which is close to their lives also. And it's a great achievement, I would say. And now uh, we had this question answer session and uh, certain questions have come up uh, from uh, those who are in uh, read, hearing this program. So I'll just uh, read out the three or four questions that have come. And then we take some questions which our co-panelists have also raised. So now from uh, those who have uh, heard this program, these are the four questions I have noted. What is the eternal cosmic truth you talk about? Parenting. What does the book say about parenting and how does it influence our present lives? Uh, what is the idea of happiness and is happiness different for different persons? Uh, uh, so these are the qu uh, questions which have been received from those who are hearing this program or seeing this program. So let's start off with that and then we'll uh, some questions raised by our panelists, will you can answer them later. Please, Rajni, your well, comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I haven't had time to even note down the questions, but I recall what Ashati is just asking. Okay, there I can see the questions now on the side. But um, 
may I uh, I respond to one of the queries that you made, Asha, and uh, I will begin with that and then take on a question from the audience quickly. Um, thanks so much. Thank you, every one of you. I'm so touched that the book resonated with you, but uh, let me talk about serenity and uh, how best to talk about serenity than to say from the book, to speak from the book, say what Asha really says. Um, and uh, you rightly mentioned, Ms. Narayan, that serenity is the active cooperation with the inevitable. Now, that's, that's a little uh, difficult to comprehend. It's, it's, it takes a little time to understand the concept, but it is a very easy thing to live by. You know, the active cooperation with the inevitable. Simply when you hear what Asaridi says, he says that, you know, you know kismat and karma. They are fundamental to serenity. Your karma is what you do. Your kismet is what you get. Your karma is what you do. Your kismet is what you get. The karma you do defines your kismet. Since no one can take away your kismet, what is yours will come to you inevitably. That erudition alone brings with it an element of serenity. And then goes on to say that, just do your karma. For that is in your hands. The karma is in your hands. The fruit of your karma or your kismet is not. Because the karmic laws never fail, my dear. He's talking to uh, Nisha. Only there may be a time lag between the results and the effort. Nature always ensures that you have exactly what you need, which may not often be what you want. Yet always you get what is due to you in the right manner, at the right place, and when the time is right. So actively cooperating with the inevitable makes sense. But that alone is the path to serenity. Uh, the second question you said was, uh, OK, well, this is from Mumbai. This is the question about um, you know, the happiness. The happiness. Okay, so this is somebody who wants to know uh, what does the idea of pursuit of happiness mean to you? Um, pursuit of happiness is something I have a, a problem with, and and it's kind of depicted in the book in the way uh, that we read from it. Huh? Uh, let's start with what he says that everybody wants happiness, right? All of us do. Only they look. That is what I'm quoting as I read this. Only they look at it where it does not lie amongst external things and it eludes them for happiness is neither attached to nor dependent upon any event or person and about that pursuit i'd like to tell you i think that's saira when you stop looking for happiness outside amidst potential gains and in a distant future if you stop seeking it all together and relax and embrace life as is, the happiness within is felt without. It, it's a little like chasing your own shadow when you pursue happiness, because uh, with happiness, Shir Ananda, and I'll quote, uh, Asariri says, leave it be, you will experience it. Like a shy bird that gently alights on your arm once you've stopped pursuing it. Um, the next question, sir, would you remind me of what the other yeah. question was? One was, what is the eternal cosmic truth? Ah, uh, wow. Cosmic <laughs> yes, got that, got that. That's, that's a rather, uh, that's a rather, uh, requires a longish answer. And uh, bear with me, it'll take a minute or so. Mm, let me read from the book, The Eternal Cosmic Truth. Uh, okay. So uh, this is Nisha asking uh, Asariri, and time and again through the book she does, that I'd like to know what the cosmic truth is. And the answer is a pragmatic worldview that divulges the eternal secret without any dogma. It's based on an infinite pool of wisdom that Asariri has access to. And I quote Asariri at page, OK. So Asariri says, There is a higher self, and the living self is but a shadow of that higher self, nay, the highest self. 
It's an esoteric cosmic power that resides within you. And in every person you meet in the world, irrespective of gender, age, caste, color, creed, or race. Uh, he goes on to, uh, you know, and then there's, well, well, the thought about the eternal truth uh, takes you through Nanak, uh, Nanak's little, uh, there's a Shabbat which uh, has been um, translated, and I'll state what Asari says about it. He says, I'm saying nothing new. It's, it's an oft repeated idea said 500 years ago on the banks of the Ravi. A pure, wise soul, Guru Nanak, spoke of the Ik, the one the formless one, and said, Whither do you seek me, O man? I am with you, within you. I reside neither in a temple, nor in a mosque, not even in places you visit as a pilgrim. Whither do you seek me, O man? I am with you, within you. And then the rest of it, um, I, I'd like to share that, if you permit. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, goes on to the cosmic truth, which is based upon several Upanishads. And the words, the translation, the collation has been done in a manner which makes it more comprehensible to an audience today. So if I may quote, all of this is from there. Uh, it's about the higher self. The higher self who lives within you, that higher self, that some may call by the name God. That higher self of whom you living, your living self is but a shadow. That higher self of whom many are not even able to hear or understand or comprehend. The higher self is myself within my heart. It's greater than the earth, greater than the sky, greater than the heavens, greater than all the worlds greater than this world put together, and the highest self is greater than all that you can conceive. The highest self is myself within my heart, smaller than a grain of rice, smaller than a corn of barley, smaller than a mustard seed, smaller even than the atom of a mustard seed. The highest self is inconceivably smaller than what is small. It is the unchangeable, the omniscient, the omnipresent, the perishable, the imperishable, the brilliant light, the immortal, the fearless, the majestic, the magnificent, the eternal one. It is without beginning, without an end, without sound, without touch, without decay, without form, without taste, without name, the eternal one. It is like pure water, poured into pure water, like the air fresh and crisp before dawn, like a drop of rain on primeval earth, like a fragrant dew drenched morn, like an enduring light without smoke, like the slice, the skies in the space beyond, like the clear water of a sparkling stream, like a blade of grass in a verdant meadow, the eternal one. Thank you, I just want to say the last bit, if you would permit. Okay, okay. Uh, the higher self is bright, blissful, brilliant, beautiful, immortal, immortal, iridescent, imperishable, and infinite. The higher self is true, pure, eternal, perfect, tranquil, absolute, veritable, ubiquitous, the creator, the preserver, the destroyer, and the fearless. Greater than the earth, greater than the sky, greater than the heavens, greater than all the worlds. All the worlds are contained in it, and there is nothing beyond. That is the ultimate truth of the cosmos. Is that good, Bela? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, answering these questions. I will close it off by just asking the last question, if you don't mind. Uh, and I must exercise this privilege as the as chairing this session. Why did uh, us really decide to leave Nisha when Nisha went on as a helping doctor in the tsunami? What was the uh, motivation of? He was with her throughout, but he leaves her when uh, she has gone to work in the tsunami. And so I wanted to understand that. And that's the last question. We'll close our fast program after that. Thank you. Uh, 
No, he doesn't leave her. He doesn't leave her at all. In fact, uh, Asariri is is her constant friend and companion through this one year in the book. And uh, he comes, the Asariri comes as and when she needs Asariri, like a true friend, when the need is there. So each time when, if you remember from the on, on the shores of the Bay of Bengal, when she's looking through that tent and can see the stars above and, and just states, what is this all about? What is this uh, immense tragedy all about? And that's when he feels. So he's there for her. It's like your Asariri and my Asariri and everybody's, um, it's there within us, comes up when, when you need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajni. And, uh, and there are so many you know, questions I still see there, but I don't know how to answer them. I'm sorry, the parenting, the one yes, the this. Yes. Well. The, we, we have run short of time and we are going to close this program. And I thank all my panelists here who have come. And I thank the author very much. You know, as I was saying, we find a link between your book and all of us somewhere inside. We, f we don't find ourselves as strangers to what you have said. We find ourselves somehow linked with what you are saying. So that's your biggest achievement in writing this book. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming and participating in this program. And thanks to those who have been watching and hearing this program for where, from wherever they are. Good evening and thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much.